Well, welcome everyone. I'm Doug Crandall. I'm joining you today to discuss a book that I've written called 22 Cents an Hour Disability Rights and the Fight to End Subminimum Wages. We're going to spend some time today together really focusing on some of the key public policy milestones related to disability employment supports in the United States with an eye on the current best practices and evidence-based practices that we have at our disposal and, and really looking at how we can inform something known as House Resolution 2373, uh, which is a bill in Congress right now that will shape employment uh, policy for folks with disabilities for many, many decades. And in doing that, we'll spend some time on exactly what the book uh, tried to examine. And that is, where are the strengths of the public policy? Where there are weaknesses? And how we can work together to elevate discovery, customized employment, other evidence-based practices around employment. So sit back. Um, we'll have a short reading, kind of get going. And then we'll dive into some of the uh, book content. Thank you. Well, again, we're going to focus on this book that I wrote and uh, was published in the spring of 2022, so pretty recent. The title is 22 Cents an Hour, Disability Rights and the Fight to End Subminimum Wages. So let's get started. The book really does take an opportunity to delve into the history uh, of employment supports and public policy in the United States. And I, I will be honest, there were some things uh, that I probably should have known. And I hope that if you didn't know some of these things, it's helpful to you. It really traces the inception of subminimum wages. And we'll, we'll talk about that some. Um, I guess I should also say this isn't a, a book that tries to look at both sides. And what I mean by that is um, there, it's impossible when you do the research to see any benefit in subminimum wages. It's more instructive for us in the field to spend some time questioning why in 2022 is it still legal. And that provides us a lot of answers to the questions related to what public policy will look like moving forward. So I just thought we could start um, with a reading. It's fairly short. Um, it's chapter five in the book, and, and the title of the chapter is The Olmstead Supreme Court Decision and Freedom Fighters. And the reason I chose this is because I think when, when I was doing the research, this jumped out at me so much. And I began to wonder why isn't some historical context provided in orientation and continuing education for people in the field of employment supports and disability. And so I also hope by writing the book and sharing it that we can do that, that we can raise the awareness around why we do some of the things that we do in our field. So. I don't know about you, but I loved reading time as a kid. So I hope you can uh, sit back, relax, and listen. On May 23rd, 1974, two men who had been in Indiana State Institutions, Leo Sonnenberg and Gerald Hartnett, filed a class action lawsuit seeking compensation for labor performed while they were patients in the institutions. The complaint contended that the plaintiffs were entitled to payment under the minimum wage and overtime provisions of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Their lawyers, though, also saw another legal angle, a violation of the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which prohibits slavery and indentured servitude. The appellate court judge defined the class members as, and in quotes, all patient workers who have labored in the state of Indiana institutions for the mentally handicapped or mentally retarded 
for May 23rd, 1970 to December 31st, 1974. The appellate court found in favor of the 7,400 patient workers and awarded $28 million in back pay for jobs performed in the institution, which ranged from working in a hair salon, cutting other patients' hair, preparing meals, cleaning, working on vehicles, doing landscape work, providing nursing care, and even working in the institution's bowling alley. Most of these jobs were found to be full-time. However, in June 1991, the appellate court was overruled by the Indiana Supreme Court in Bayh versus Sonnenberg, where the court found that the labor fit within the civic duty exception to forced labor. Quote, the court looks to whether mental patients work had ever been compensated throughout history because the constitutional convention records make clear the framers did not intend to create new rights to compensation. In fact, the 1986 constitution makes clear that the institutionalized may be made to work when they are receiving services. In the 1991 case that the Supreme Court in Indiana overruled, one justice, Justice Dixon, found exceptions with the concept of involuntary servitude. Quote, other jurisdictions have found that patient labor does not fit squarely into the civic duty exception. The requirements of the extended full-time work go way beyond the civic duty requirement. Now, Dixon goes on to say, working at the state's mental institutions was not required of all citizens. The labor of patients slash workers was not demanded for merely a few days each year. It was required full time during their confinement. End of quote. The fact that Justice Dixon used the term citizen rather than patient, even if only once in 1991, was promising. There would be no $28 million in back pay for the 7,400 citizens held captive in Indiana institutions, but others would take up the fight in just a few years. Thank you for indulging me in that reading. I don't know about you, but that feels like a gut punch. When uh, I first began researching this case specifically for chapter five, I, I I obviously didn't know much about it, a little bit. Um, but the fact that it was filed in 1974 for $28 million in back pay, the fact that it was overturned um, was really stunning to me. And because that chapter is really related to Olmstead, uh, which we'll, we'll visit here in a bit, you can see the groundwork being put there. Now, most people would read that and understand why it was overruled. But I think it brings into focus something that's very important for us. And that is that our work in one major court case invoked the 13th, 13th Amendment in the prohibition of slavery and indentured servitude. That should tell us something deeply about our systems. Well, let's get into some other milestones on this next slide. And we'll go kind of from the inception. I'm sorry, well, that's the next slide after this one, but we'll focus on the milestones today and moving from that inception to uh, some of the key turning points. And then we're driving, as I said in the beginning, driving towards what can we do right now and our roles around disability and employment policy in the United States by being informed enough uh, to make sure that we're not repeating some of the unintended consequences of the Fair Labor Standards Act. So on the next slide, you'll see that in 1938, the Fair Labor Standards Act passes. Now it's important to understand here that we as a country are not even celebrating a century 
of employment protections. What's that mean? Well, prior to 1938, there were children mining coal. There was no overtime protections, no uh, on-the-job safety or OSHA. We didn't have um, the right to organize uh, for union representation. So it is pretty ironic that the Fair Labor Standards Act um, also includes what is often referred to as 14C, which is just the section of the Fair Labor Standards Act that made it permissible and legal uh, to uh, pay people subminimum wages. Now, did the folks who originated uh, out of the US Department of Labor and the Roosevelt administration intend to hurt people? Of course not. It was really though, if we're taking a very clear eyed uh, look back in history, it was policy essentially set up for white men who worked in manufacturing. We had had a world war, we're getting close to entering a second one. Uh, we had um, people returning uh, who had largely been impacted through physical disabilities in combat. And so it was an opportunity to try to, uh, in policy, make some provisions for those workers. Certainly they would be considered workers with disabilities, but they were white men uh, with disabilities from mostly uh, combat. Now, we didn't even have the idea of a community rehabilitation provider in 1938. So as you heard from the Sonnenberg case in 1974, they referred to those folks as patient workers. It's instructive to know that over the years, we've developed four different categories of subminimum wage certificates. Most of us in our field are really only aware of the community rehabilitation provider certificates, but there's the patient workers list that I talked about earlier. There's the student worker experience program. And in 2018 in Southern California, um, there were nearly 2000 students in special ed being paid subminimum wages, clear, clear violation of IDEA. Um, but for the most part, um, in 1938, these were businesses that had and held the 14C certificate. There are still uh, for-profit businesses, some of them you would know very well, particularly in the hospitality area, that have their own two-day 14C certificates. So 1938 is certainly where it originates, but for a couple decades, not much happens. It's mostly in the United States businesses, for-profit, private businesses that have these certificates certificates. But something starts to happen, and you have to understand that the subtitle of 22 cents an hour, disability rights, this is happening alongside real strides to make our culture, our public access much more accessible to folks with disabilities. So all along the way, as 14C uh, has hearings and committee oversights. We're making huge strides again in disability rights to civil rights. But from 1938, you could argue again for a couple decades, it largely stays within business and mostly for again, white men with disabilities from combat or, you know, uh, on the job accidents. But as a country, we start questioning when a child is born with intellectual and developmental disabilities that parents are pushing back and saying, no, we're gonna keep our child at home. At the same time, we're starting to uh, really be critical of, of our institutions and considering community care. Now, this is decades before Medicaid waivers and obviously the ADA and Olmstead. IDEA, all those things, uh, you know, the Rehabilitation Acts of 1973. 
But in the middle to late 50s, early 60s, there are families who get together. There's a great example that I give in the book of a provider organization in Tennessee and in Memphis to, to get the money necessary to build a sheltered workshops, uh, sheltered workshop, moms go door to door selling cans of baked beans. And they weren't doing that to exploit their children. They weren't doing that out of anything but love. But it's here in this history where things start to turn. So instead of just businesses having these 14C certificates, now we have organizations, local ARCs, ARCs, uh, local uh, cerebral palsy chapters, and others uh, on the provider side um, start to apply for uh, these certificates. And this new category of community re rehabilitation provider is opened up. So it spreads pretty quickly. You can see that in the 70s and 80s, um, the, the number of 14C certificates that are going to provider agencies um, increases over 200%. So this idea of you know, a special place to be, special wages, all that is, is necessary in the eyes of the folks who are helping expand this. Now, we certainly, and this is something really important to know, and it's covered in the first part of the book, that from its inception, subminimum wages has a severe lack of scrutiny. Um, and some have said there was no scrutiny at all for several decades. It was just a free-for-all. But even at, at its best, um, U.S. Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division was only able to audit or do some oversight of about 3% of the 14C certificates. As this grows and spreads within uh, rehabilitation and, and agency providers, the same thing happens on the trade organization side, the trade groups. Those start to form in states, provider agencies get together, uh, they take their lessons from other parts of our economies. They see that there are lobbyists working in education and energy um, all across the board. You can see that that's how influence is garnered uh, in the capital. And so these organizations form. And one of their very first uh, kind of political agenda items as part of their trade groups and lobbying is something that happens in 1986. And this fundamentally changes. And this is instructive now. <laughs> All these dates are instructive, but this is really important because you can see what lobbying does here in 1986. And then as we move to 2022, uh, it's a cautionary tale. Well, what happens in 1986? Probably the most ridiculous phrase uh, I found during this research, and there were quite a bit, was something that the trade groups called the minimum subminimum wage. Now, say that out loud uh, to yourself and see if that uh, seems absurd. The minimum subminimum wage. And what they do prior to 1986, there was a general agreement between wage and hour at USDOL and the community entities that were applying and getting these 14C subminimum wage certificates. And that was, there was an understanding that it would never go below half of the current minimum wage. Well, in 1986, the lobbyists uh, form, get together and say, actually, we want you to remove that. And they successfully lobby in 1986 to remove the minimum subminimum wage rate. And now from 1986 to the 
today, um, people can be paid as little as a cent an hour. The 22 cents an hour that is the title, main title of the book comes from the boycotts in the early two, 2010s around the country, um, looking at the high pay of CEOs uh, in provider organizations, which were hundreds of thousands of dollars, and that some workers with disabilities were being paid 22 cents an hour. Well, this really shifts things. In other words, this makes the expansion and adoption of supported employment uh, more difficult. I wanna pause here because I think there's something that is really important to understand in parallel. And I mentioned it a little earlier around disability rights as civil rights, but there's another layer. So as we see all these achievements and great strides in disability rights, one of those on the employment side was the testing and um, piloting of supported employment. This is really deeply happening in 1986. So there's not, that's not a mystery about why they lobbied to remove the minimum subminimum wage because the supported employment principles and concepts had now been fully released into state VR programs and in four or five years it would be also included in Medicaid waivers. So there's a, a, there's a, a back and forth between the entities that wanna keep and preserve subminimum wages and those folks who are early adopters, both researchers and practitioners around supported employment. Now, of course, customized employment doesn't come along in the federal register until 2001. Um, but we see that early on in the late 80s and early 90s, that this is a challenge to what we uh, have termed in the book, the disability industrial complex. There's really no better analogy uh, than, than the disability industrial complex. But the point being here that it's no longer just about civil rights or economic justice, it's about uh, systems, states, and organizations, and trade groups trying to keep the status quo. Well, that's a blow to most folks, but supported employment continued on. But by the middle 90s, there's something that happens that's a really, really important piece to um, both the DOJ consent decrees in Rhode Island and Oregon and elsewhere, um, three women in Georgia, uh, Sue Jamison, who was a lawyer, Lois Curtis, and Elaine Wilson, both who had been institutionalized many, many times uh, in and out of state institutions in Georgia, homeless, um, justice involved back to the institution. And in these institutions, both women just like the Sonnenberg case in Indiana in 1974, are doing major full-time jobs in these institutions during their stays. And their lawyer, uh, Lois Curtis's and Elaine William, uh, Wilson's attorney, Sue Jamison, wanted to challenge the public integration of Title II of the ADA because as advocates worked with the two women, the state DD agency in Georgia, uh, the governor's office said, nope, all you get is the state institution. That's all, You're, we're not gonna give you the funds under a waiver to live in the community. So it was a perfect um, case to take all the way to the Supreme Court. It is known as the Olmstead Supreme Court decision, challenging once again, the public integration around services in the least restrictive environment. So you can see that this, the civil rights history related to disability builds on these milestones, yes? So it was not a unanimous decision, the Olmstead case, uh, but it found um, that what was required of states uh, around this uh, Title II and least restrictive environment that 
One, the person had to desire to live outside the institution, which is pretty difficult for me to even imagine someone who would say, I want to stay in the institution. Um, professionals, professionals had to agree it was appropriate, and that uh, is obviously a weakness of Olmstead. Um, and then the third part of the Olmstead Supreme Court decision, and this is just, you know, in a nutshell, you can Google and read as much as you'd like about the Olmstead Supreme Court decision. But the third one was that by providing services, employment services, residential services in the community, it wouldn't adversely affect others. Um, and of course, there's some wiggle room there for states. But you can also now Google I am Olmstead and see that that uh, piece of our history uh, has been critical in challenging subminimum wages, again, in Oregon and Rhode Island and elsewhere. Um, it's a violation of not only the ADA, um, but the Olmstead Supreme Court decision. These things go on to truly inform um, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act that happens in 2016, but we've got a good, uh, we've got a good 15 years there in between, right? So one of the revelatory experiences in researching this book is to understand that there are at least documented nearly a hundred attempts federally to examine, analyze, provide hearings, oversight committees, and almost all of them, and these start really early 60s. So we're, we're talking, 60 years of oversight and hearings and committees. And almost all of them point out the rampant abuse. And I think this is one of those tough things to admit right? as, as folks who work in this field. And that is that a good bit of this has just been rephrased and reframed. It's a, again, cautionary tale about HR 2373 and what we can do now. But without understanding some of this history, we may not question what ends up getting uh, put into that bill and then essentially into legislation and public law. Well, one of the things that is, I think, instructive as well in this story is there's no other way to say it. There are heroes <laughs> and there are villains. They really are. And it makes certainly the narrative arc interesting, but it's heartbreaking. And one of the most salient examples of that is in 2009. But I want to take us back to 1979 before we hit 2009. In 1979 in Des Moines, Iowa, there there's a journalist, a woman journalist who is just a great writer, um, still working today. But all the way back in 1979, in a place called Adelissa, Iowa, she had heard about this program, this program called Henry's Turkey Service, and that it employed 30 plus men. Uh, again, back then, the terminology would be mental retardation. And she was suspicious of how wonderful this program was uh, because she knew just from some superficial uh, reporting that the men were being paid $65 a month for 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, sometimes 60 hours a week. And they were housed in a horrible bunkhouse that this for-profit company um, at Henry's Turkey Service got from Adelissa, Iowa, the city council for free. These men had lived in Texas. Um, the two owners of Henry's Turkey Service brought them from Texas to uh, Iowa, sanctioned by, wait for it, the state uh, of Texas Vocational Rehabilitation Agency. She reports in 1979 some really concerns, two days front page, that the men were mistreated, that they were often called names, that they were working for pennies on the hour, 
right alongside people who are making $13 and $14 an hour. And it's important to know that if it wasn't for our public policy, those men would not be there. In other words, the owners of Henry's Turkey Service uh, saw an opening for very, very cheap labor, and they took it. Now you would say, well, then why is Henry's Turkey Service listed as 2009? The most heartbreaking piece here is it takes us as a country 30 years to close down Henry's Turkey Service for all those abuses. The woman who was the investigator reporter did her job. She spent two days reporting on this a very critical issue and looking at uh, Henry's Turkey Service with a critical eye. And it took a sister 30 years later to call with some complaints. And so what, what we find then, as more information comes out after 2009, it's closed down, uh, the state of Iowa gets involved. Um, but what we see then are deep abuses. Some of the men would run away from Henry's Turkey Service. They would be tracked down, brought back, and chained to their bed. There's a reason that in 1974, the lawyers for Sonnenberg versus the state of Indiana and Governor Bayh invoked the 13th Amendment. In 2011, the National Disability Rights Network, along with lots of other folks, uh, published what is known as segregated and exploited and argued that subminimum wages needed to be shut off immediately. And it portrayed lots of folks who were working uh, using customized employment. Well, here's another little downer, and I promise we're going to get to some, some positive pieces here. But on the heels of that white paper, segregated and exploited, we take our first shot again at passing uh, some legislation, an act to um, eliminate subminimum wages. That happens in 2011 and 2012, and it's called the Fair Wages for Workers with Disabilities Act. And this was also very eye-opening in the research. There were national trade groups who most American citizens would assume are helping people with disabilities, were spending millions of dollars in lobbying efforts to make sure Fair Wages for Workers with Disabilities Act was not passed was not passed. And you might already know the punchline here, it was not passed. So knowing that there were folks at the National Federation for the Blind and other uh, really great advocacy entities that formed together and did some boycotts, uh, very well-known provider organizations that were arguing to keep subminimum wages. That was somewhat effective, and that takes us over 2013 and 2014 and 2015 uh, when some legislation was being crafted, known as the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, fully implemented in 2016. And in 2016, as the country, we signal that subminimum wages aren't great, <laughs> but they're still legal and that state public vocational rehabilitation agencies uh, and VR counselors must um, not only counsel people on real jobs with real wages, but have to be very um, uh, diligent in how they are referring people to sheltered workshops and subminimum wages. But 2016 is the last large piece of legislation that we have related to this issue. 12 states, uh, there are a couple more in line, probably in 2023 and 2024, to either write executive orders or pass legislation to ban subminimum wages. And just this year, um, 14 states were funded under something called the Subminimum Wage to Competitive Integrated Employment Grant Cycle at Rehabilitation Services Administration under their Disability Innovation Fund. So we've made some strides, but where's that lead us? 
Where does it leave us here? Well, HR 2373 is our opportunity. If you've never gone um, to the, the website that hosts all the current bills in Congress, both in the House and Senate, it's, it's really worth doing this. If you've never done it, you can sign up for an alert uh, for HR 2373. You can see in your state, you know, who are my elected representatives and officials who have signed on as co-sponsors. But more importantly, and I hope this is the point in the book, is that it is arguably whatever passes in probably 2023 related to subminimum wages and our employment support systems, it, it's possible that that will also last 84 years, just like the 14C being passed in 1938. So we gotta get it right. We have to make sure that those of us who are practicing um, evidence-based practices and best practices and discovery and customized employment and IPS, that we are informing the legislation. We can do that as private citizens, as subject matter experts. I'll tell you the reason why that's important because those entities that in 2011 and 2012 were spending millions of dollars to fight fair wages for workers with disabilities, again, under this umbrella of benevolence, um, they're, they're already at the table. They're already crafting this. And it's also important to know that John Butterworth's um, uh, data related to folks being in subminimum wages um, and looking at core data sets show that, you know, just in the last 15 years, the number of people who are moved over just into non-work day programs has increased by 20%. And we see even more of that as states and as providers are held to not only Olmstead and the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, but informed choice, self-determination. We have all the things that we need. And I wanna just briefly pull up an infographic that we'll kind of end on here. And I won't go through every piece of it, but the infographic really lays out, particularly over the last 20 plus years, the um, access to and the testing of these evidence-based practices. Every one of these milestones and associated actions could have been ameliorated uh, with good evidence-based practices. And we have that at our disposal now. That's one of the things we gotta make sure gets into HR 2373 and that is states and individual provider agencies must be held accountable to doing practices that we know have evidence behind them and that have uh, a likelihood of success. So let's take a look at that infographic. So as you see here, it really starts around 2002. And I'll tell you why this is, the timeline is, is really useful. One, it mirrors what's in, in the book um, on these kind of milestones looking at recent history. Um, but the argument here is we have everything we need to make subminimum wages and poor employment supports for workers with disabilities a thing of the past. We have exactly what we need, including fidelity scales, right, that have been validated through peer-reviewed research. We have the ODEP, Office of Disability Employment Policy competency model. Um, we have customized employment codified into law in 2014, fully by 2016. We have the customized job development fidelity scale and um, the scale that is related to consultive job coaching and discovery. We have three of those scales from 2018 to 2022. And as you can see below the timeline, you see the states that are using fidelity. You see that not only in the United States, but in Australia and in Spain, that we are testing uh, the discovery fidelity scale. And you'll 
also see in some of this that there are state agencies involved with the funding piece, that, that it's embedded in long-term care and home and community-based services. More than 18 articles strictly connected to peer reviews, um, look at customized employment fidelity. And we have across the country now, this number is even higher, uh, 200 folks trained in using these fidelity scales. That's important because we're bringing the employment and disability support systems in the United States, um, upgrading it for 2022. And we're all part of that. And to conclude, we just wanna make sure that we reiterate some resources here for the book and for white papers and podcasts related to this issue, you can visit uh, www.abolish14c.com. There you can find the reader's guide, which uh, really cool. We're using this with some high school students, um, some book clubs, and some professional development as well. And that reader's guide just helps you reflect on the content. You saw the customized employment infographic. That's nice to have just you know on your desktop or printed out for reference. For HR 2373, which is the Transformation to Competitive Integrated Employment Act, you can go to congress.gov, as I mentioned earlier, congress.gov, and you simply just search for HR 2373, and you can sign up for those alerts and look at the bill summary, as well as uh, checking on who is signed on as a co-sponsor. And you'll get updates in your email box. Finally, and this is mentioned in the infographic, but, uh, and in our narrative as we were sharing the, the content, um, we really need to make sure that HR 2373 um, has peppered throughout it the expectation and the use of evidence-based and best practices. The research for the book has shown that we have done anything we could think of in employment supports, particularly for folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities that have not worked. And so it has to be an expectation that we use good, um, good practices that we know have evidence behind them. Thank you.